Hey everybody, this is Jordan from Web Developer Training. All right, so I've got another video here. This video is gonna focus around a question that I got from somebody on Facebook. And I'm really grateful to ask this question. Hopefully we can have a good discussion about it. So the question is, I would welcome some guidance on how to think about balancing the task of HTML generation between the server and the client. So we're gonna talk about server-side code and we're gonna talk about client-side code. Used to be one did as much as possible server-side, but these days there's a lot more muscle and it's standard to hand off some of the work to the client. How thick should a client be? All right, so the basic question here seems to be, what is an appropriate separation of concerns between the client and between the server. So first let's talk about computing environments and locations for computing. So essentially all computing when we're building these applications has to take place on a physical machine that is located somewhere. Typically when we talk about the client, the client is the device that our clients or our end users are going to be using. So typically when we're talking about web applications, the client is going to be the browser, but it could also be a mobile app. It could be, so yeah, it could be running on, it'll typically, sorry, it'll typically be running on a phone, typically be running on a, on a laptop or a desktop computer, some computer that the end user or the client has access and control over. And yes, in web applications, we're gonna be talking about browsers most particularly, but it's not, if you're talking about a client, it doesn't have to be a browser. So don't don't get funneled into, sometimes I feel like the definitions that we've been taught are a little too rigid and then we get confused when, you know, words mean, you know, the concepts mean things that are slightly more broad than we were taught. So a client is just typically the computing device of your end user. Now a server is also just a computer and it's a real computer physically running somewhere all all your code has to execute somewhere there is actually a physical machine that's going to be executing it um, and typically the server is going to be controlled by the developers of the application or, or the people who are running the application and the server is typically a dedicated computer that's always running that must be very secure depending on what kind of you know data um, it's holding I mean, it should be secure enough that people can't take it down, at least, if, even if it's not holding secure data. And usually it's pretty, you know, powerful enough to be able to serve the requests of many people and, you know, has good RAM, good memory, good storage, good hard drive, or good solid state drive. So yeah, we've got client computers and we've got server computers. So when we're building an application, we need to think where do we actually want our code to execute physically? And the you know the person who asked the question talked about how in the past lots of things were done server side. Now I can only speculate and make educated guesses about why that was. I think it's because in the past client computing was uh, much less powerful. So your servers could be dedicated they could be very expensive but they could serve hundreds or thousands or more users but now our client computers are getting extremely powerful um, we have gigahertz gigahertz speeds on our cpus we have maybe multiple gigabytes of ram and many many gigabytes of persistent storage so our clients are getting powerful so my hypothesis here my opinion is that you should push as much as you can to the client as possible. That should be your rule of thumb. Everything should be executing on the client, if possible. You should only execute code outside of the client if you absolutely have to. Now, why is this? It is a lot simpler when you only have to worry about one execution environment, generally speaking, I would say. If you're splitting up where your code is executing over multiple computers, now we're getting into distributed computing. A distributed application 
generally is going to be more difficult than a non-distributed application. I mean, it's just, it's kind of like, you know, basically makes sense, right? If you have more pieces, it's going to be more complex, generally speaking. So you want to push as much into one competing environment as possible. Now, usually we, we're going to be serving many, many, many users with our web applications. We would all like to have hundreds, thousands, millions of users potentially. But usually your application is going to be serving one user in particular at a time. Like we want many users to be having an experience, but they're usually going to be having an experience with each other, at least, you know, the most basic web application you can think of it like that. And so the end user is going to be interacting with the application directly from their device. Now, it's simpler to code. I also believe it's going to be, if you can push as much code as possible to the client's device, it's going to be faster for that client. Now, there's one thing that we need to think about here. One of the, the slowest things that we can't really control is latency. The speed of light through the mediums that are generally used for our internet communications is fixed, at least from our point of view. And so if, I'm, if my client device is in California and there's a server somewhere in Europe, there's going to be a certain number of milliseconds that that's going to take. And yes, you know, with fiber optic cables, with low Earth orbit satellites, may, you know, all kinds of things, we might be able to minimize the latency, but there's still going to be a minimum amount of latency that we're not going to be able to overcome. And so if you're always refreshing or always having to hit the network to essentially do anything on your web application, that's going to lead to a bad experience. And that's why you should try to push everything to the client. When you hit buttons on your client, you should have a client side router that switches views for you right there. That will be almost instantaneous. It will be like one, I think many, like a small fraction of a millisecond to switch that view rather than potentially tens or hundreds of milliseconds to go hit a server. And I believe once you hit around, get around 200 milliseconds, it becomes noticeable to human being. So one fifth of a second or so. You don't want that. So, so you don't want to be hitting a remote server over and over whenever you're doing something on your client application. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It's going to be slow. Um, so yeah, there's speed. Doing everything locally as much as possible. That's the fastest possible computing experience you're going to get. There's development complexity. It's just simpler if you think about one competing environment. Also, security. So the this goes back to the, to the computing environments. The fewer physical machines, the fewer instances of code running, the fewer opportunities for people to attack that code. So essentially, we're shrinking our attack surface. Our attack surface being, you know, the surface area of exposed running code that people have the opportunity to attack. If you don't have a server running, then people can't hack the server. Do anything possible to not have a server running. It will lead to a life of pain and misery. If you have to, you have to. And I mean, you probably will have to, but as a rule of thumb, you should aim to not have servers running. So yeah, we've gone over, you know, it's simpler conceptually, it's faster latency wise for most operations that you're gonna do. It's more secure. Uh, let's let's jump into this, let's jump into the Jamstack. So the Jamstack is not a actual piece of code, it's not a library or framework. It's essentially a paradigm or a nomenclature around a set of principles. I'll just read this. A modern architecture, create fast and secure sites and dynamic apps with JavaScript, APIs, and pre-rendered markups served without web servers. So JAM stands for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. 
essentially creating single page applications. These applications are written with static source code. So JavaScript files, CSS files, HTML files. I mean, you know, it could be TypeScript files or maybe other languages that compile the JavaScript. But the point is there, you, you type them and you take those, those files and you don't change them after you deploy the application. You deploy the application essentially to a set of servers that you don't own or operate. Now, right here it says served without web servers. That doesn't really make sense. I mean, unless you're like deploying your web application to like a Nintendo 64 cartridge and emailing it to somebody, then it wouldn't be served with a web server. But in traditional web applications that we're going to be building, even progressive web apps that look like and feel like native apps, the content needs to get to the user's device somehow. The client has to get the code somehow. So there's going to be a web server or a set of web servers running somewhere. So I, I kind of don't agree with that. But you, to you, you don't own the servers. You don't operate the servers. You don't have to think about the servers. And these types of services are called CDNs or content delivery networks. A content delivery network is essentially a managed set of, a globally managed set of servers that you can deploy static assets to. And that global set of servers will take your assets, which are your application, and they will distribute the application amongst you know, themselves, amongst those servers. And then when people access your web application, the server closest to them will serve up the application. So if I deploy an application and I live in California, but my users are in England, if they had if the serve if the application had to be served from servers in California or Oregon, somewhere in you know the Western region, there's gonna be latency. And they'd have to wait for that latency. I don't know how much it would be, maybe a hundred milliseconds or something. But if you deploy to a content delivery network, there might be a server actually in England. And those users in England could then have the application served to them directly from England. Now CDNs abstract all this away, so you don't have to actually think about this. You just write your application in such a way that it is a fully client-side app as much as possible. And then you deploy it to the CDN, and then you're done. Now, obviously, this is limiting. You can't, not everything can be a static, can be just static assets. For example, we are talking about web applications, right? We're trying to build applications that are interactive that have features beyond just consuming content. If we're just talking about websites where you just consume content, like, I don't know, just a newspaper, all it is is static content, you just read it, go to the next article. Yeah, you maybe could do that completely client-side and not have any servers except for the CDN. And so to you as a developer, you wouldn't have to worry about anything. But generally speaking, we're gonna have more functionality than that. And that's where the A comes in, APIs. So anytime you actually need computing outside of the client, the Jamstack says you should use an API to do it. What does API stand for? Application Programming Interface. So it's it's essentially an interface to another application. So a third party, so there, I guess there are two types of APIs we can Sorry, I don't think I, I, I explained what an API is well enough for those who might not know. An API essentially is a list of, of functions or a list of names representing functionality on uh, that you can access as a programmer. So for example, the web browser itself has a bunch of APIs that are provided to us, and they're usually provided to us through the window object. So if I go window, uh, what's a good API? Ooh, can't even think of one. Okay, look, window.accelerometer. This is part of the web API. 
window is an interface which has many properties and we can access each of the properties and those properties give us access to special features that we wouldn't have access to otherwise. So window.accelerometer and then, you know, it has, I guess, a few things that you could work with. So that's a, an API that's provided to you in the browser. There are many third party APIs that you could access potentially over HTTP. So for example, if you want to build a web application that deals with Google Docs or Google Sheets or Google Drive in any way, Google provides an API that you can access. So from when, within your client side application, you can make HTTP requests to Google servers and Google servers will do what you tell them and return stuff to you, but you don't have to worry about Google servers. So you try to abstract things away into APIs. Now those are third party APIs. So if you used a, a Google Drive API, that'd be third party. If you used a GitHub API to manage repositories, do stuff like that, that'd be third party. If you use like the weather channels API to get weather stats, that'd be a third party API. Now the first party APIs would be your own APIs. And the Jamstack realizes that you might have to do that. And so what you should do though, is you, sh is you should still keep the separation. You should have just static assets in a whole client side, single page application that you can deploy to a CDN. And that's the actual you know, interface, the user interface that your, your clients are gonna receive. And if you have your own functionality that needs to run on a server, such as a database, if you need to save people's data and it needs to be accessed 24 seven, and needs to be super secure and other people also need to access it. So, you know, you have some kind of collaborative thing like Google Docs, they need a, a server, a common server that many people can access because people are gonna be collaborating. People need to access certain docs when other people are offline, et, et cetera. So in that case, yes, you need to have your own server running. You might need to spin up an AWS instance you you know build spin up a postgres server create a a web server on top of that so you can manage authorization and authentication and maybe do some other things yes that's when you might need servers but in my opinion for your html content for your templating you you don't want servers at runtime after your application is deployed you don't want those things building up HTML for you. Yes, there might be certain circumstances that, but I think those would be very niche and very rare. I I honestly n pretty much never, um, for the vast majority of the applications that I do, for the vast majority of the functionality, I do not render HTML in real time. It's all static and I'll use a web components library or just the web components APIs themselves to do all my HTML templating and rendering client side. Okay, and so if you need server side code, then that's when you will create your own API, run your own server, you know, do database stuff, do machine learning computations, do image processing, anything you need, but all that stuff should be completely separate from your HTML templating. Do not render things on the server, in my opinion. Okay, let's go into the Jamstack just a little bit more. Let me read each of these so that we understand. JavaScript, any dynamic programming during the request response cycle is handled by JavaScript, running entirely on the client. That's the important part, I think. Running on the client. This could be any front-end framework library or even vanilla JavaScript. So yes, you could use React or Angular or just vanilla. I honestly would use, like I said, web components, and I would use TypeScript, but it doesn't really matter. APIs, all server-side processes or database actions are abstracted into reusable APIs accessed over HTTPS with JavaScript. These can be custom built or leverage third party services. So yes, first party yourself, third party, other people. Markup, templated markup should be pre-built at deploy time, usually being a site, using a site generator for content sites or a build tool for web apps. Uh, I mean, you can look into that more if you want. Personally, I would use a client side templating solution like lit HTML or React or something. You don't necessarily have to pre-render everything, but you could also do that. 
So things that are not the Jamstack. So I guess the traditional things like monolithic web servers like Ruby on Rails, not following the Jamstack, not. I'm in the process of refactoring a good sized Ruby application from the old client server, you know, do HTML stuff on the server to a single page application. And it's kind of painful and just don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Just say no to Ruby on Rails. WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, a single page app that uses isomorph running to build views on the server at runtime. Yeah, like just don't build views on the server at runtime. I just don't think you need to do that. And let's go into the why just a little bit more. You get better performance. Like we talked about, we talked about higher security. We talked about better developer experience. Let me read that. Loose coupling and separation of controls allow for more targeted development and debugging. And the expanding selection of CMS options for site generators remove the need to maintain a separate stack for content and marketing. When you have to change context, when you when you have a client context and a server context, and the code is different, and potentially, you know, the environments are different, the APIs available to you are different, the languages you are using might be different. That's going to cause a lot of complexity and friction. Even in, it, like some people might think, oh, it's fine, it's simple. No, it causes complexity. And then cheaper, easier scaling. This is, you know, like we talked about. When your deployment amounts to a stack of files that can be served anywhere, scaling is a matter of serving those files in more places. CDNs are perfect for this and often include scaling in all their plans. So it's just awesome. Okay, hopefully I explained that well enough. If you have questions, please go to the Telegram group, t.me slash web developer training. You can ask me questions. And you can ask for me to do a video on a topic of your choice, of course. So let me talk about the stack that I recommend. Okay, so web applications, there's only a few basic technologies that you really need. One is HTML. Don't, I wouldn't change HTML. I would use HTML straight up. Don't use Haml. Don't use markup languages that are hiding or abstracting HTML away. I, it doesn't make sense to have a declarative markup language for a declarative markup language, in my opinion. It's just gonna cause complexity. So just use straight up HTML. CSS, in my opinion, just use straight up CSS. Don't use less, don't use SAS. CSS is getting more powerful. The APIs are getting better. They have CSS variables uh, natively in I think most browsers. And also you can use JavaScript with your CSS in certain ways to overcome that. I, I would I just wouldn't compl complicate your build process with with CSS features. Just just use straight up CSS. So HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript. JavaScript is the general purpose programming language. It's what gives us our dynamic capabilities. I obviously love JavaScript and recommend that you use it. But really, I recommend you use TypeScript. TypeScript adds static type annotations to JavaScript. So essentially what this does is gives you static analysis capabilities. So before your code executes, TypeScript can tell you a lot about what bugs might be present. I can do a whole different video on this, but I recommend using TypeScript. So use HTML, use CSS, use TypeScript. Now, the client side code, now that we're pushing out to the client, it's gonna get rather complex. We're gonna be storing stuff in memory. There's gonna be lots of state changes. So your variables are gonna be changing you're going to present different things based on what's going on. So I recommend using Redux. Essentially, Redux lets you use global variables safely. And in, so it lets you use a, just one giant global variable for all the client side state, essentially, right? That greatly simplifies things. You just centralize it all into one place so you know where it is. But it manages the access to it and lets you essentially have very easy logging capabilities so that with all the changes that are going on, you always know where you came from so that you can get to where you're going correctly. So I would use Redux. Now, there's all kinds of different component models, different libraries and frameworks that people are pushing. React is probably the most popular. Angular is another huge one. There's Ember. There's, wait, what? React, Angular. Oh, oh, Vue. Vue is another huge one. 
each of these libraries or frameworks essentially are building a component model. A component model is essentially a, a component is a container for your HTML, your CSS, and your JavaScript so that you can encapsulate and focus one component on one piece of functionality. It's revolutionary. It's a great way to think about applications. It manages complexity very well. But some component model implementations are better than others, in my opinion. All the component models are essentially identical, but the actual implementations are what, what differ. And though React's paradigm is amazing, you know, it essentially uses functional programming so that your view is a function of your state. Though view is probably really easy to use and all the other ones have whatever, you know, just never use Angular, by the way. I just, I, I came from Angular 1 and Angular 2. I used them extensively and I left and I'm so glad and I'm never going back because there's just so many unnecessary features that just confuse you. So there's all these. Now, all of these uh, component models, their implementations are built in JavaScript and they're outside of the browser API. So the browser doesn't give you these libraries natively. You have to ship these libraries and you have to use their APIs. And they're not standard APIs. Now the web browser itself offers you a standard component model that is built into the web browser. Um, it, which allows you to create your own components, essentially allows you to create your own custom HTML elements and lets you encapsulate your HTML, CSS, JavaScript for each feature, just like React or Angular do, essentially. But the APIs are built into the browser. And now it doesn't give you everything that React or Angular will give you, but with a, maybe one or two libraries on top, I feel like you get everything that you need and it's much simpler and you don't have to ship as much JavaScript to the browser. And so I highly recommend looking into web components. And if you're gonna use web components, I highly recommend using lit HTML, which is a templating library. So in the past, you might've done server side templating where on the server, when you're returning, uh, you would return a view in your response. So you'd essentially get a request, you'd go to the database, gather all your data together, build up an HTML string essentially, and you return it to, to the response, you would return it in the response and it would go to the client and render. So we're trying to get rid of that model completely, right? Do it all in the client. So inside your web components, you will now use lit HTML to do your templating. So you'll pass lit HTML all the variables that you want and you'll create your template right there. And it's declarative, it's simple, it has a lot, it looks a lot like React's JSX, if you are familiar with that, but it uses more standard APIs. It just uses the JavaScript template little syntax, and it's, it's just simpler. It, you don't need to build process, it's just nice. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Redux for state management, web components with the HTML for your component model. Now, here comes the API part. Anything that you need to do outside of the web browser, I highly recommend using GraphQL to access those APIs. So for third party APIs, hopefully they have a GraphQL API available to you. GraphQL is a very nice declarative syntax that just lets you query and manipulate data in a way that is, it's declarative, it's simple. It's essentially it's, you pass, you pass the left-hand side of a JSON object to a server and it returns the entire JSON object back to you. It's very easy to think about. And if you need to make your own APIs, I highly recommend putting a GraphQL API on top of whatever functionality that you need. It will make your life and the life of your teammates and the world better. Now, once you have all this, I highly recommend using Netlify to deploy your static assets. Netlify will hook up into GitHub really easy, I think also into other uh, version control services. And it takes care of the content delivery network, the CDN for you. And they're just really nice. They have great customer service in my experience and their stuff works really well. And I just love it. I use it pretty much for everything. So Netlify is how you can deploy your client side code. And if you really need server side code, the good old Amazon Web Services is pretty good. It's pretty complicated actually. Um, but you know, 
that's a whole nother story is getting into server side stuff. So if you have questions about that, we can even do a whole nother video. So I guess that's it. Hopefully that answers that question. And like I said, go to t.me slash web developer training to access the Telegram group. And you can ask more questions there and ask for more videos.